In our first webinar, we focused on how you can achieve efficiency gains by applying the lean approach to your farming business. And since then, we've posted some videos and links on our Facebook page to get you started on this. Last week, we had George Collier from ICL um, talking about how to manage farm businesses through a high cost environment. Um, he's given us plenty of ideas and in in ways in which we can look at expenditure, uh, free up income and some tips and tricks around insurance and ACC. Um, we will, we've recorded that one and we'll post it on our Facebook page in due course and um, shortly I'm going to put the link up in the chat to the Facebook page so you can access it if you haven't already. Uh, tonight we're very much future focused, looking at silver linings and opportunities for the red meat sector. I know the last couple of years have been really challenging, so we want to finish on a positive note here, letting you know that there is some light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping notes. If you've got any questions, we encourage you to ask questions throughout tonight's webinar. Um, please just click on the chat icon below. So if you hover your mouse over the screen, you'll see a little chat icon there. You can type your question into the chat box and we will gather them together and put them to the speakers at the end of the webinar. Also, please just make sure that your camera and microphone are turned off during the session. Right, let's get into it. Tonight we are fortunate to be joined by both Jen Corcoran from Raro Bank and Jacqueline Roth from Lincoln University. First up, we're going to hear from Jen. Uh, Jen hails from a sheep and beef background, um, working more recently in agronomy and now works as a senior analyst for animal protein for Raro Bank. She's going to examine the current outlook, silver linings and opportunities in the medium term for the red meat sector. Thanks, Jen. I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Nick. So can everyone see my screen there? Yep. All good to go. Okay, so we are going to have um, probably about 20 minutes uh, having a look at the red meat sector in New Zealand. Um, where we're at now and kind of what some of the silver linings and I guess opportunities, but also challenges um, over the next couple of years. So um, thanks for having me, and it's really nice to have uh, an opportunity to talk through some of this stuff um, in this crazy world that we're living in at the moment. So a quick disclaimer, um, this presentation right now that I'm about to give is for information purposes only. So just remember that the material is general in nature. It is based on data, um, but it doesn't take anyone's personal circumstances into an account. So just um, remember that, and um, obviously it's always best to talk um, and get advice from someone who you know understands your own specific situation. So that said, um, what is the global picture? So you know, New Zealand is a small exporting nation, right? So we're sitting down here in the South Pacific Sea, but we're punching well above our weight in terms of the food that we can produce, and you know we're an exporting nation, providing a lot of red meat protein uh, as well as dairy uh, to the world. Now this means that we are affected by what goes on globally and that is something that we really need to stay abreast at, um, to in New Zealand. So 2023 to 24, um, I'm not telling you anything new if I say that it's been really volatile times, right? So we've seen huge inflationary pressures uh, driven by cost of living and you know economic challenge globally. There's been geopolitical challenges, um, you know, the war, in the war in Ukraine in 2022 really ended up arriving at the farm gate in terms of some of those input prices that we were seeing and those on-farm inflationary costs. So these sorts of things happen a world away but affect us hugely down here in New Zealand in terms of what we're doing, in terms of the costs that we have to pay in our farming businesses and also um, the returns that we're getting, which we've seen more recently with China, obviously, um, going through an economic, I guess, boom after um, the... Uh, the swine flu in 18, 2018, 19, 20, meaning, you know, red meat protein from New Zealand was was rushing out the door towards China from the safe place that it was here, pushed prices well up, which made this downturn that's happened for them after COVID and their lack of spending um, and the GDP growth slowing right down, all the more difficult to take because um, it was such a difference from what we saw in that 2021, 22 time. So these sorts of things are affecting us and they can be made worse by what happens just before or just after as well. Um, obviously, everything here is, is pretty much out of our control in New Zealand, especially for farm gate producers. 
Um, and the weather is obviously something else that we are very much at the mercy of and one, you know, that we can't do much about. So these are the uncontrollables and they'll continue to affect us. But the best thing that we can do is keep abreast to whatever information we can gather. This will affect, you know, the farm gate prices that we're getting. Now, just to mention China again, um, we're hugely exposed to China and New Zealand presently. So, you know, by volume, up to 60% of sheep meat in recent years, 40% of beef and around about that 33, 34% of dairy going to this one country. So when they slow down in terms of what they're doing, it will affect us here. And then since about 2022, we've been seeing this rapid slowdown in terms of their economic growth and what they're spending. So we just need to keep an eye on what's going on over there and wait for that big old ship to turn around. Or what else can we do and what other markets can we send our product to? Now, there's one final wild card, and, and this is sort of the macro stuff that we want to keep an eye on, and that's that this 2024 year that we're in is a super election year, right? So, you know, over half of the world's population is going to the polls this year, or has already been, and these sorts of changes that this can bring about with changed governments or leaders around the world around sustainability policies, trade agreements, nutrition policies, these types of things can affect us and how we trade into the future. So again, not much we can do to control it, but just something that we want to keep an eye on, um, the outcome of some of these elections. So what are the silver linings in the road ahead for us in New Zealand? So if we start off with beef, um, US, uh, the US is steering the ship at the moment for some really, really strong returns. Um, I hope you like that punny title there. Um, but basically what's driving it here is the US domestic land trimmings price. So it's it's nearly 50% above the average uh, of the past five years in terms of what they're paying domestically for their land trimming. So this is the 90% chemical lean beef, which is essentially like cow cows, um, bull beef, that lean manufacturing beef. And what they use that for is essentially to, to mix in with their fattier cuts, so the 50 or 70 percent um, lean meat, like fattened heifers or steers or feedlots, they mix in that manufacturing beef, beef with it to make hamburgers. And that's what they're screaming out and demand for. And the reason for that is that the US beef herd is currently at its lowest level in 60 to 70 years. So very few beef cows going in for slaughter, supply and demand, there's just not enough of them. They need to import more of this manufacturing beef and it's driving prices well and truly up higher. So I think, you know, our prices are 20% higher than what they've been in recent years going to the US, which is pulling the whole ship up. So this is also driving some really good gains um, in some of our secondary markets. Now, the US and China are, are one for one, you know, so we'll talk about that in a minute in terms of taking volumes of New Zealand beef because this big market that we supply is really willing to pay. It's driving that competition up. There's also, you know, an elephant in the room around the number of, of beef animals there are in New Zealand at the moment, and that procurement pressure that the processors want to get their hands on means that we are seeing um, a little bit of that driving upside as well as what we're seeing in the exports. Now, big green arrow poking upwards equals big, exciting green shoot. Um, but the little bit of downside, which is not as big, is things to watch that may bring downside to pricing, which is that China is still not willing to pay for volume. So, you know, that market is still very soft. And we're seeing pretty high production volume out of Australia. Now, don't fear too much there for now, um, because overall beef production globally is not super high. But again, don't get too scared about that one after what's been going on with sheep. But, um, but um, that is just something else to watch there. The other thing to remember with beef, it's a versatile protein. Now, I won't talk too much about this now, but it does have a lot of end uses. It's, um, it's well-liked. People know how to cook it. It's a popular protein globally. Therefore, the volatility that we see in this market is never as much as some of the more niche products, which we'll get to. Now, if we think of our key export markets for beef in New Zealand this year, the China, US is taking China out. So, uh, the volumes of beef to the US are up. It's our number one market for beef at the moment, and China is down by about 24%. Now, this is great news for us because we actually get a higher export value also for beef going towards the US shores um, in a normal year and even more upside in a year with our sort of paying to get that volume. Now, just to quickly cover off some of the other markets here that we send beef to. So this is the, the season to date. So that's the slaughter season, which is October till the end of September. 
And this data here goes from October till the end of July, which is um, all that's available at the moment. But what you can see there is the tonnage off to the USA is is beating China by quite a wee bit. And, um, you know, we'll get close to our quota this year, which I think is 213 uh, tons, and that's in the annual year, I believe. So this is the value of the export. So obviously we've got volume and value. They're two different things. But there you see 41% um, of the value that we're getting for our beef this year is, um, is the US. Now, this is a big sort of silver lining in that we aren't seeing we won't expect to see much downside in this over the next two or three years. They're going to continue to have strong demand for manufacturing beef, which is going to pull some of the prime and other cohorts of cattle prices up. Really good news. Last year we had 36% apiece, I think, for volume and, va and value for the US and China. So um, big upside, I guess, there. These other good news, China, sorry, around Japan and Canada are all up. So I think Japan volumes are up 61% this year. Canada also up by 69%. So we're seeing some really big gains in some of our secondary markets. So in terms of um, that volume piece. Now, interestingly, just to compare again the two big markets of China and the US. Now, this is the volumes in the bars and the values of the lines. Now, that top line that's um, up by those big yellow bars on the right there as we as we head towards July 2024 shows the USA. So you, are, you can see there is that the volumes um, of beef going to the US are up each month, but also that value. So the per kilo price that we're getting for that beef is up really high. And this is just bringing more export earnings into New Zealand, more of which can be passed on to farmers. So the outlook for beef is really strong at the moment and driven by this big North Star of the US being one of our main markets, really pushing prices up for us. And the rebuild of the herd over there is going to take a few years. So what we expect to see is, you know, strong demand, reasonable prices going forward. Now, if we just look now at what's happening and the metric that we followed on this one is the North Island bull price. Um, but what I can tell you also is that all cohorts of cattle are seeing sort of these increases versus their five-year averages as well. So good news, um, that yellow line is lurking up in, in no man's land above the five-year averages. So really strong prices and, um, and we expect that to continue um, likely tracking sideways from now on. So where are we at with sheep meat moving along? Uh, as most of you will probably be aware, Australia and New Zealand lead the global export of sheep meat. So obviously other countries eat sheep and they might produce it domestically and consume it domestically. But for us um, down here, we are basically the two big producers in terms of exports of sheep meat globally. Now, Australia has been beating us for the last few years. This is 2022 data and 37% of volumes came from Aussie, 32 from us. It'll be interesting to see what it was this year given the Australian production has been quite high. And unless you've been hiding this year, you'll know that this past 18 months has been very challenging for us in New Zealand because the Australian land production um, has been at record levels and they've been flooding the market at a time when, you know, global economic situations haven't been super um, vibrant and thus... Um, a lot of supply um, and not so much demand for this kind of high premium niche product. So that blue line there is the 2024 weekly slaughter numbers. So it's looming well above the 10-year average range, which just shows how many animals they've had going through, um, which just shows that competition piece. So again, I show this because we need to be kind to ourselves. We have had a really challenging time for multiple reasons. Good news and one of the other silver linings for the sheep meat industry this year is that the Australian land volumes have peaked, we think, um, in terms of our forecasts and what, and what we're looking at with MLA and, and all of the guys over the, that side of the ditch. Um, but the 2024 volumes will be the highest. However, next year's still going to be pretty high um, at sort of those 2023 levels, but starting to decline. So it is good news. Um, things will start to improve in terms of that competition piece. But we can't control that so much. What can we control? So this is just a wee... Pie graph just to show you the percentage. So this doesn't show the volume, but just the percentage of lamb that we are sending to what market. So we've got China then taking nearly 50% as the average over the last five years to the end of 2023 uh, of, our, of our lamb volumes. Now we've got the UAE 27 countries and the UK coming in sort of a quarter between them um, and the US and then a few others in amongst it. 
Alpine is the lot most low value market. However, it's extremely important and this doesn't show mutton as well, but for sheep meat overall for New Zealand, it's a huge market for us. And it's really important because it does take lower value cuts. It takes mutton, it takes lamb flaps, it takes bones, all sorts of things that are really hard to find a home for at times. So it's an important market for us. We don't want to run away from China, but what we need to recognize with lamb at least in some of the high value um, parts of the animal that we can probably glean a little bit more um, consistent income. And that's, I guess, what we really want, um, consistency of that export spend, uh, export income, sorry. So if we just look to this year to see what's been going on up until the end of July. So again, this is just the season uh, that we're in. So October to July um, to date. So volumes to China, um, and this is total sheep meat, are down 15%. And we're actually seeing a bit of upside in our other market, our other main markets. So great news. Just remembering that the volume piece is still really high for China. Um, but good news to see some value uh, coming from these other markets, which is slowly starting to help drive these average export values up. So that um, orange line in the middle there is your average export value for total sheep meat, which is, I guess, what we get overall. And you can see this, this line starting to, to tick up. So Good news um, and sort of positive to the future because as the export values increase, what is passed on to producers in the farm gate is, is a higher price. So we continue to watch, but um, it's heading back in the right direction. And um, and even that mutton price is starting to, starting to slowly creep up down there at the bottom too. So um, here's the South Island lamb price as of today, 770, I think was the Agri HQ where we get our, our data um, for South Island lamb. So we're starting to, to come back up in the right direction, passing that line from last year, which is good news after a very challenging um, time. We believe it's the bottom of the cycle has been hit um, and things will slowly improve. Creeping sideways underneath that five-year price is my um, prediction here. Again, more upside next year and the year after when these Aussie numbers start to come down, which they will. It's been a, a tough time out there. So just to quickly summarise it before I pass over to Jacqueline, um, there are some green shoots. The Australian cycle has peaked, and this will help us in time, but it's still going to be you know, decent numbers, not something we can control what's going on over there. We could see this current downturn that we've been through with sheep as an opportunity for change. Um, and I'm not saying change away from sheep meat. I'm saying within the industry, what do we need to change in order to ensure that export value that we are getting for the product is more consistent? Now, this could mean some volume moves away from China. There will be a ceiling here. Um, there's only so much we can move away from that market. However, in the past, you know, the UAE, in the UK have been really good markets for us for sheep meat. We're not using um, as much of that free trade agreement for either as there we could. So, you know, there's more, more volume that could be going over to these markets that offer a higher value. The US is another one that could be tapped into further. Remembering that sheep meat is sort of a niche premium product, which um, I think that we'll talk a little bit more to the types of proteins and, and you know, what that means for the consumer. But um, there are also things that we could learn from Australia and what they're doing. They have a much more diverse range of markets in their sheep meat exports. 37% of their production is actually eaten domestically in Australia. We eat 5% of our lamb. So, you know, what could we do there? Um, what other distribution channels do we have for sheep meat? Like what is what are the big things that we could change? And, of course, the other important one is investment um, and spending money to, to, to get better. Um, investing in the right things, technology, genetics, whatever it might mean throughout the supply chain and also on our farm. So things are improving. Um, they will continue to improve slowly and um, it's going to be kind of up to what happens in the next year to, to, to sort of figure out what's going to happen because there will be another cycle at some stage. Um, and just quickly, the, as I said, the outlook for sheep meat is positive in the long term, but it is a niche product. We've got some work to do. Beef is a versatile protein and it's popular. There is some stuff to be said around grass fed and we have a great story to tell there. It's important to remember through times of volatility that diversity can really help. So 
you know, this may become more and more important in years to come to reduce that volatility of prices that we get for our products. Now, protein consumption is, remains important. Red meat is hugely nutritious. Aging demographics need protein. And, you know, there's great nutritional profile in terms of the red meat that we produce here in New Zealand. And it is a sustainable way that we do it. Um, the other thing New Zealand can fiercely protect is is the great story we have around animal welfare and the way we raise our animals. But also we're an island nation. We um, have some real strengths there in terms of biosecurity and disease risk. So um, protecting that fiercely is really important. So, And just before I hand over to Ed to Jacqueline, um, things are going to continue to be volatile. It's um, something that we know for sure. We're in the long game of agriculture and we do see cycles. The best way to get through a cycle is to learn from it and figure out how to get do better next time when we come back through it. There may be a need for diversification and um, red meat's great premium protein. And what New Zealand does well is produce it in a healthy and sustainable way. But we need to focus mainly on the things that we can control um, whilst learning from the things that we can't. And with that, I will pass over to Jacqueline. Thank you very much, Jen. Um, that was really useful to get an up-to-date picture on what's happening globally with both supply and demand for beef and sheep meat. And it's great to see um, multiple silver linings appearing, which should hopefully see the situation start to improve going forward. Um, I'll, you've already unshared your screen. Just um, I'll get Jacqueline to put her presentation up, and just as she's doing that, I'll try an introduction. Um, you probably don't need an introduction, Jacqueline, because um, a lot of you would have heard from Jacqueline in the media, where she's a champion for New Zealand agriculture and is frequently involved in dispelling myths around our food production systems. No idea, um, exactly. She's held a number of research, education, and management roles with universities, <laughs> both within New Zealand and abroad, as well as the EPA and um, she's currently a member of the board of directors on Dairy NZ in Ravenstown as well as her role as adjunct uh, professor at U Lincoln University. So Jacqueline's going to speak to us tonight about consumer trends for New Zealand growing red meat. I'll hand what can you actually see? We can see your presentation. We can oh see that's good, that's a miracle. The biggest carbon footprint. Right, right. The subtext of this of I laugh hysterically because of the fundamental problems I'm having at this end, is don't believe headlines. Always question what you're being presented with. And unless Nicola or Jen or I tell you something, just ask the questions. In 2019, we had this headline across Scoop, for all Food Frontier, Veg News, RNZ. They were telling us that 33% of New Zealanders are ditching meat. And some of us thought, really? And others said it's terrible. The whole meat industry is going to collapse. New Zealand's going to be in a terrible state. And what was the reality? Indeed, why did it actually happen? And the why is because of examples like this. Poor and Nemechek all over the press, BBC presenting their news from science, saying our problem is that... Uh, greenhouse gas emissions per kilo of beef, here's beef, here's lamb, are much higher than anything else in terms of food and where you can get your protein. And this is per serving. So one has to remember that per serving is not the same thing as protein. But the press don't care. They just talk about the terrible impact of beef and sheep and how we all have to change our diets. So if that's the case, how come we get the OECD and FAO doing the predictions of what's going to happen? So this is 2024 and came out in about July, saying that in the next 10 years, we're going to have an 11% increase in beef consumption, a 16% increase in sh uh, sheep consumption, and per capita meat consumption will increase by 2%. This is mostly to do with the developing nations, their middle, um, increasing middle uh, income type people. But it's, it's not just the number of people, it's actually more people eating more. And for the headlines, one could just stop there, except that uh, we go as scientists liking more data. 
And these are the data for New Zealand. Oh, hell. And this is research that was actually done by the University of Otago. And it looked at, they had about uh, 15,000 people in this. They asked in 2017, what sort of diet do you eat? 12 and a half people, 12 and a half thousand people said they were omnivores. They came back in 2018 and said, what sort of diet do you eat now? And of those 12,343 omnivores, 121 had become vegetarian and 125 had changed back. Of those omnivores, 23 had become vegan and 24 had changed back. You get the picture. People say they're going to do something, but actually it doesn't mean that they are going to do it for the rest of their lives. And here are the UK data. This is my home country. In 2019, only 5% of people who intended to go meat-free succeeded. In 2021, post-COVID, it was less than 2% of intentions became reality. So the Veganuary people and v vegan eating during January, they make great statements about how 50,000 people have taken the pledge, but they don't stick with it. It's rather like dry July. There's some recent research out of the EU, as in like last month, and you can see here that 75% of people are omnivores. They eat normal stuff. 16.1% are flexitarian, which we could say is you eat what you like when you like, or we could say the more official definition is eating less meat. And then there's the tiny component that a vegetarian 4.4%, these people eat fish, but not red meat, and vegans 2.2%. And this is despite the fact that a lot of the increase in population is occurring in areas, countries with particularly um, religious determined diets. But you might have heard um, Muslim saying, and I'm going to quote the commissioner, high commission person from India, who was here in New Zealand saying, you probably think that most Muslims are vegetarian. They are on Wednesdays. And so some of the things we believe aren't actually upheld in quite the way that we think they're upheld. Though, of course, there are some people who are, well, determined to do what they say they do. The reason it's Wednesdays is because that's not a great day for uh, inviting people to your home or going to other people's homes. This is the rationale he explained. When you invite people to your home, you don't know what their diet's going to be like, so you present everything. And then when you go to their home, they don't know what your diet's going to be like, so they present everything. <clears throat> the same goes for alcohol, which is quite useful for wine. Excuse me. I'm just going to cough and get see if I can do. No, I can't. There'll be disaster if I cut myself off. I'll I'll try to deal with it. Here are, because you've heard that the young are more likely to have extreme diets than others. And this is the 18 to 24 percent, actually 3.1 percent vegan and uh, 25 to 34s, a few more. But these are all actually tiny amounts. And we still have the bulk of people being omnivore. Now, I have to alert you to a new food eating category that has just come out like about three days ago, open omnivores. These are the flexitarians of the future. The people who eat what they like when they like, but <clears throat> might eat less meat in the future. On the other hand, they might not. And here are the more significant data from the International Food Information Council uh, taken at the beginning of the year. <clears throat> and you will see that over the years from 2010, they do this every year, you will see that taste is right at the top. So there, um, Jen mentioned the omega-3s, they're what's part of gives the meat the mouthfeel that is appreciated by so many people. 
It also translates to cheese. Again, the mouthfeel of New Zealand grass-fed cheddar is apparently quite different from, uh, well, Americans don't really have the thing, stuff I'd call cheese, but even the European flavour is different because some their animals are housed during the winter. Then there's price. Then there's health for about 62% of people. Convenience is pretty important. And environmental sustainability is down at 30% of the decision the drivers on purchase price, 30%. And it's dropped from 2022, which I think is pretty interesting. This bit, this change, this part's particularly environmental sustainability. Before 2018, it was just sustainability. So taste, price, health, convenience, environmental sustainability. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? You don't really buy food unless it's going to taste nice, the days of castor oil are over. But here is what the rich people choose. And the rich people are looking at taste. Over 90% of the driver is taste. Rich people, this is a household income of about 150,000. Um, it would in a New Zealand dollars. And then we have health. So there is what um, Jen was mentioning in terms of protein. And increasingly, it's known that for muscle building, protein, good accessible animal protein is what helps. And increasingly in the rest homes, in the great research out of Ireland, saying that we must stop feeding them lentils and beans. And I'm not talking about the obvious concerns one might have with flatulence in old age pension homes, but I'm thinking about muscle mass. They're saying feed these people an easily digestible muscle um, protein diet so that they can maintain their muscle mass. And honestly, we're missing a trick with lamb. Lamb is the least allergenic food along with chicken, but it's got twice the amount of iron. I, that in, in all this dietary requirement stuff, lamb is least allergenic and should be promoted more. Then we have price. It doesn't matter so much if you're a rich household. And then convenience. What could be more convenient than a bit of steak or lamb rack? And then there's the environmental sustainability. Now, environmental sustainability does matter more for these people, the rich people, than for the bulk. And this, of course, is the group that we're trying to target, the premium markets, the premium markets. And here you see data from Australia, CSIRO, that um, they're looking at what um, a great diet, so we've got the current average diet, and that's this column in terms of servings and the recommended servings for a least impact diet that actually meets your nutritional needs. Fundamentally, the average diet at the moment is cropland scarcity. That means water and land and kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalents per day doesn't meet their nutritional needs. They're not eating enough fruit. They're not eating enough vegetables. They're not eating enough fiber. They're not eating enough red meat. They're not eating enough dairy food. And you've got to wonder, are they all fading away? No, because look at the amount of fast food. And when we have discretionary fast food, and we're suggesting it's cut down, uh, that would be something like three squares of chocolate or 200 mils, one, one serving that is, um, one serving of those tiny packets of evil, crispy, fatty things called potato chips, and um, 200 mils of wine is one serving and something like 350 of beer. So the Australians are not meeting their nutritional needs. If they actually ate more red meat, and we've heard from Jen, they do produce quite a lot of lamb, they could help with cutting down their impact, particularly if you use precision agriculture, and particularly if you actually use um, 
beef and lamb, as I'll show you, from New Zealand rather than from the rest of the world. They produce, um, Australians tend to produce more methane per kilo of beef and lamb because their pasture quality is not as great, so they grow more slowly. Here's the cradle to grave, and this is actually EU data, right to the um, into the into Europe, and you'll see that the New Zealand average. This is cradle to grave beef, uh, kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilo of live weight, and New Zealand's highest, which I'm afraid is hard hill country, is lower than the average from Europe, and it's certainly better than Italy. So they should stick to mm, fashion and fast cars, except the fast cars create carbon dioxide from fossil fuel, which is bad, as we know. This is dairy beef. Sorry, guys. But it is does help because the mother, her greenhouse gases are into dairy. And here's the sheep data. We are fantastic. Part of that, and this is kilograms per tonne of carcass from the Lincoln University work, part of this is because the um, UK animals live longer, they don't grow as quickly, and they use far more antibiotics. And I don't know why we worry about people being vegan, because this is an example of vegan food being left on the supermarket shelves. They said it was during COVID, but it was actually the um, supermarket in um, the hurricane picture. Fundamentally, if taste is number one, vegan food is probably not going to cut it. In fact, there's been a quite a backlash against the whole plant-based and veganism push. And 29th of August, Google search for carnivore diet has increased 87% in the past year. The new term of meat fluences, working through social media, talking about their prowess in terms of speed, strength, all of that sort of thing, and apparently offsetting the plant-based push. We all know about beef and spinach, the health aspect, the accessibility of the iron in beef being, you know, the absorption rate being so much better. Um, but we forget about lamb. Look at that, more in lamb than in beef. And remember I said it's a, a low allergenic meat. So we should be pushing that sort of thing in my humble belief. But I would also like to think about how people make their choices. And it is true that beef has gone down in the waiting in the shopping basket. And this is terms of expenditure. So given that beef has gone up, and this is um, based on a unit price kind of relative to um, 2020 at the moment, so 3.2% of the food expenditure going on beef, where it was 3.58. In lamb, actually, it hasn't changed that much from 2011, but there was a peak around 2014. Uh, Stats NZ does this only every few years. I think they, from the look of it, they're due to do another one, but it sort of got delayed like many things with COVID. Pork's gone up slightly. And um, poultry, actually, it's down from a decade ago. But look at this. So the restaurant meals, which is where you probably would be eating beef and lamb. And the ready to eat meals, which is certainly where you're going to be eating the hamburger type stuff. Um, and potentially any of the lamb korma or whatever. That's actually gone up. So back here, we were just over 20, 20 almost 21% of the food expenditure was on restaurant and ready to eat meals. And now, well, you can see, it's gone up considerably. And that's where some of our beef expenditure has gone. So feel happy and our lamb expenditure, be happy about what has happened here. The other thing to remember, is that though people can uh, talk about the importance of um, food and the escalation, we keep talking about the 
cost of living crisis. It's housing that's more driving this and housing that is more concerning to people. So right at the top, we got housing. Oh, inflation, sorry, inflation and cost of living is right at the top at 59%. Then there's housing and price of housing and then healthcare. When we think about the greenhouse gases that I opened the talk with, it's um, kind of only 19%. And I will put in water concerns at 6%. People are much more concerned about cost of living than anything else. And here is something that you might or might not choose to talk about at the supermarket when people start complaining about our product. And that is that food, if we look back at 2011 and now, if you had to spend a dollar on a food item in 2011, by 2020, you would have had to have paid a dollar 10. And by 2024, because of the big surge during COVID and the Ukraine war, you'd have to pay a dollar 34. But in that time, the dollar that you received in wages has become a dollar 59. So as a proportion of the budget of your household income, of your wages, you are spending less on food than you did in 2011. And what's really gone up is housing. So it's at $2.34 in comparison with a dollar in 2011. For our futures, remembering that people are more concerned about cost than anything else, it means for me that anything we can do that assists with productivity gains, and remember New Zealand agriculture drives productivity gains in New Zealand, anything that we can do in terms of environmental impact must not put up the price of food. Anything that we can do with animal welfare must not put up the price of food. And if we can do use gene technologies to help increase productivity that will actually help stabilize food price, that is where people will be delighted. And the same, frankly, with most of the agrochemicals, as long as they're safe, which of course they are, because nobody would introduce an agrochemical that was likely to cause problems because the litigation would be too great. All of these things are under discussion with policy people at the moment. But when you actually ask society in general what they think of agriculture, most of them are pretty positive. They think we're doing a good, a good job. Some research on regenerative agriculture came out of Europe uh, last week. And the people looking for answers about regenerative were a bit surprised that when, when the normal citizen was asked, what do you think of agriculture? They said, it's great. Our farm is, farmers are terrific. They do a super job with their animals and their environment and the food they produce. And only when prompted did they start suggesting that organics or regenerative or something like that might be better? So sometimes I think we should actually stop asking questions. I think the term is poke the bear. I hope you like that, Dean, because you've been doing the special sentences at the beginning. I think we should keep with our great product, high animal welfare, low environmental impact, our health benefits, the fabulous taste, and think about the convenience. It's a lot more convenient to deal with some beautiful cut of meat than it is to try and grate carrots and your fingers or cook beans for how many hours. So thank you for that. In my view, we do have a great future and the big trends are on point for allowing us to have an even better future than we have now. So I will stop sharing. Oh, make me go small. I'm far too big. Ah. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, that was really refreshing to know what the reality of what goes on behind the scenes with the uh, non-meat-eating population is and uh, <laughs> put into perspective the real concerns of consumers and society in general. Um, I think that's quite good to have at the fore of your mind when you're reading those articles in the media. 
Um, now, I realize it's a lot of content for everyone to take in and you may wish to come back to this presentation for a fresher in the future, perhaps before a dinner party with your vegan friends. Um, mm -hmm. So we're going to make tonight's recording available on the um, Farming for Profit Facebook page, which I put a link to in the chat box. So um, jump on there and um, it should be available hopefully in a week or so. Um, now, we've got a few questions coming in few specific ones actually um, at this point for Jen around markets etc and the first one is are we too exposed to China for our sheep meat exports? Yeah um, it's a great question and I guess you know being that exposed to one market has risk uh, it's important to recognise over the last 15 years, China's been an amazing market for New Zealand um, in terms of adding, you know, the, the most export value we can get for our red meat is if we're using every single part of every single animal and we're getting value for it, right? So that um, upside that we've had from China, from lamb flaps, which we're getting like 11 bucks, I think they're back at five now, but during, um, you know, during that crazy 2021 period, it's been a great place for us to, to 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 send meat, and it's not too far away. The shipping stuff is a little bit easier in a way. Um, there's some great relationships over in China, but if China stops buying and we're exposed to them up to sixty percent for one commodity, then you know that's a challenge and a lot a really high risk. So I think there is definitely room to diversify our portfolio. And I guess leading into that next question, I can read in the chat there. Um, around what are the key learnings we can take from Australia and how they market their lamb. So, you know, Australia, I, th I think they send 14% of their sheep meat exports to, to, to China. And yes, they, you know, they had such high inventories and such high production that they, you know, they saw a price, price crash for lamb and mutton as well. But what happened soon after the crash was that things started to improve for them. And the reason being, possibly is that they have a more diversified spread of markets. So 14% to China, 14% to the US, 14% to other Asian countries, 37% are dating at home, which is a bit of a, of a crazy advantage. I think six point something kilos per capita on the OECD data for Australia. Uh, my colleague who works for rubber research as well in Australia takes the value at an eight from his own calculations, which is a lot. And we're at like less than two kilos in New Zealand. So Yes, they are eating more than us. They've also got a bigger population. But I think we can learn from Australia in terms of, you know, the diversity of export markets, you know, the fact that they push lamb into a domestic market, they advertise it, they talk about, you know, the health benefits of it, the higher iron content, the fact that it is very good for you, easy to digest. Um, they also are very present globally in terms of marketing their lamb and um, sheep meat products. So, yes, we are too. But I think perhaps they have a little bit more firepower behind them and um, certainly over the last few years anyway. So I think New Zealand could do a little bit more work um, or collaborate more with Australia, especially around some of the stories that we can tell in the way that we produce meat down here. Um, and if we're the two big exporters, you know, there could be room for collaboration with them. So I think there's some learnings that we can certainly take. So. I'll stop talking because this is a really long answer to that question. <laughs> no, it's interesting though. Thank you. Um, we've got a few questions also about India and the free trade agreement or uh, potential there. Um, I'm not sure if you want to speak more generally, but what might some of the opportunities be for New Zealand? Um, we've got questions here around whether it might be a good secondary market for mutton or low value cuts of lamb um, that would historically go to China. Yeah, thoughts? yeah. And, you know, we do need to look for markets outside of China that will take the low value. So there's there's a few of them, the Middle East and some of these other Asian countries, for sure. Um, it's challenging when we haven't been sending a large volume of product or we have, we're limited by trade access as well in some of these new markets. It's not just as easy as being like, even if we got a free trade agreement tomorrow, it's not quite as easy as, okay, cool, now we start sending hundreds of tonnes of mutton to India. Of course, there's a huge population there uh, and it's a huge market but you know you need relationships on the ground over there too you know talking to the meat processors it, it's obviously a huge part of it so it wouldn't be like a fast game um, there's huge protectionism globally now like you know the golden years of trade have probably passed in that sense but um, 
there's opportunities for sure and there could potentially be you know with India and again we don't have that free trade agreement yet and it will take a long time if we're going to get it but you know I think they are the largest um, they make a huge amount of strong wool carpets in India so you know like whether there's an upside there for New Zealand wool into the future if we could get something going on you know just park anything to do with cattle to the side and let's focus on other things and you know, there could be potential and it'll be definitely something worthy of looking into um, because, you know, strong wool carpet is, is the only type of carpet that they make and they are big on it. So that could be a great diversification for our New Zealand sheep farmers back to the future. <laughs> but, yeah, these other markets are, are great and um, but challenging to, to set up, yeah. Cool. Thanks, Jen. I'll throw one over to Jacqueline now around metrics. Um, do we need to mm. utilise kgs of CO2 equivalent per kg of live weight as a metric when selling our red meat exports? Um, sounds like a good news story that we should that people oh. should know about efficiency of red meat production. Yes, and the fundamental problem is a which particular metric to use and the carbon dioxide equivalents are fine if we're thinking comparing beef with beef the minute you start looking at plants where methane isn't involved then of course you might be looking at GWP star let's all tear our hair out because then they'll say oh yes but we should we do something else and you shouldn't be counting x and it becomes one of those um, I'll develop my own system so that I come out best so if we can do Warwick's just put up something about the health benefits and low allergenic etc I think we meet the taste, health, convenience, uh, price, and environmental sustainability. It's the gen overall package. I think this was what Silver Fern Farms was trying to do with Taste Pure Nature. Um, and Beef and Lamb's done some great things. Actually, was it Beef and Lamb that did Taste Pure Nature? Sorry. And um, so I um, Silver Fern Farm's doing something similar, but it's that aspect of capturing the imagination that people keep talking about. But then Jen's just brought up the protectionism. And that's what happens when you start getting specific. So Dean's question about metrics is right. But the minute you start getting specific, people will find a wiggle way around it. So can we sell a story? We've got the product, but I think that some of the trends are going our way. So we won't have, um, we will find markets wanting to pay the premium. Cool. Thank you, Jacqueline. That was a good way to round up the um, webinar. Just want to say a couple of big thank yous to both of you for joining us tonight. We really appreciate you giving up your evening to speak to us and I'm certain that your presentations have um, given our attendees reason to be optimistic about the future for red meat. So that's great. That's what we're aiming to do. Um, big thank you to everyone that's joined us today and for our other webinars. I hope you found this series helpful as you work to improve the profitability of your farm business. If you have any follow-up questions or you'd like further resources, please um, feel free to reach out either via our Facebook page or you can email myself or Dean Cinnamon. Um, we will post webinars two and three on our Facebook page once they're available and we'll also put up some related resources um, after tonight's session. So there's something for you to go back to. That's all from me. Um, thank you all for attending and um, we'll see you next time.